The Brexit failures of 2016 play out in the 2020s. Now, for those who are pro-EU, I encourage people not to look too much at 2016. The thing about 2016 is the referendum that was held then. Uh, we, pro-EU people, we lost that referendum. We can't win it. And people know, mostly, how they voted or didn't vote in 2016. They know which side of the argument they were on. The 2020s has to be a new argument. The time to question the validity of the 2016 referendum is over. So I'm not a Brexit denier. I know that Brexit happened. Uh, I wouldn't have done all this stuff if it wasn't for that fact. It happened, uh, rightly or wrongly, and you know we can take a view on that, but it happened. And the efforts to overturn that referendum, I'm not saying that they weren't worth a try, but those efforts are past. Uh, we can't go back to the courts, declare the referendum illegal, uh, or even if we could, then it wouldn't change the situation regarding our membership of the EC. We left. The point about what was said in the 2016 referendum, which people may feel was not fair, was not reasonable, was not accurate, uh, the point about what was said is that if it had been true, then that would have yielded benefits in the 2020s. We would have seen the effects of, or we would have seen positive effects from Brexit, and those are not happening. So when you see the polls showing that an increasing number of people see Brexit as a mistake, an increasing number would vote to rejoin, then the point is there's really nothing that can happen to turn that around. There are no Brexit opportunities on their way, which will alter people's opinions. Uh, famously, Jacob Rees-Mogg asked to come up with a Brexit benefit, uh, cited the signs in the Dartford Tunnel that could be in yards rather than metres. More seriously, uh, in a debate with Daniel Hannan, said, well, let's look at two tests for Britain uh, abroad and at home, and has Britain passed those tests? And what he was citing was the vaccination rollout and Britain's response to Ukraine, or to the war in Ukraine. Now, both of those are good things, but neither depended upon leaving the EU. Let's take the vaccination, for example. Um, the, Britain did have the ability to do exactly what it did if it had been a member of the EU. And in fact, the vaccination rollout started during the transition period. Now, when you say that to pro-Brexiters, they say, ah, but if we had been in the EU, we might not have actually done that. Um, and the same, by the way, applies to the response to Ukraine. I'm not decrying Britain's response. But you can't make a case for leaving the EU based on the idea that if we had been in the EU, we wouldn't have used the opportunity that we had to act independently. Because what you're saying is we want to change the rules and the rules weren't uh, restraining us from doing what the UK eventually chose to do. So there are no Brexit opportunities coming. There's nothing that's going to turn the argument around. And the point about what was said that we may feel was inaccurate in 2016 is not that we can go to back to 2016 and uh, you know turn the clock back and change the result. The point is that those are the foundations for the Brexit that we now have. Uh, the foundations are flimsy, and that's why it cannot last. Uh, we do explore Brexit impact in our latest book, Augusta Lees and I. Uh, it's my party and I'll lie if I want to. And if you scan that QR code, you can go straight to Amazon to buy the book. Why not do that? Or give it as a present to somebody, to somebody that you love that would love to get that as a present from you. OK, little commercial plug at the end. You'll be getting used to those, uh, but I hope you found the video interesting. Please subscribe to the channel. Thank you.